When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. strength to face the day and in your presence all our fears are washed away cause when we see
I I can't tell you how excited I am to see you guys. That's that's great. We have a newest little member. <laughs> he's here this morning. You can't see him. He's actually on the floor. Okay. His name is Atticus. Okay. And uh, when you go by his mom and dad, he may be snoozing. He may be gone by something. Okay. But uh, you go by and say hello to Atticus. Okay. It's, it's great to, to have everybody back here this morning. Looking forward to adding more as the warmer weather comes on and people get a little vaccination. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Palm Sunday. Glad that you're here. Now, this Palm Sunday, following our Reading Sermon series, we're moving forward into our Easter season. The advent of Palm Sunday is a journey with a message entitled Hosanna, Hosanna. It's a message that echoes the shouts of the crowd present on the day when Jesus made his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. They threw their palm branches before him, as was the custom. Some would take their cloaks and throw them on the ground in front of him, proclaiming him to be their king, the anointed one, the Messiah, sent from God. It was an incredible moment. Have you ever been around someone who's in one moment, though, and covetous in the next. You ever found yourself thanking God for all that He has blessed you with, and then in the next moment, looking around, thinking, But if I only had that, I'd be satisfied. We find ourselves capable of being satisfied or appeased. These kind of people are never truly grateful for what they have. Instead, they're always looking for what they can get. It's getting more and more. They're always looking for what's better to top what they've already had that's good enough. This is based on a whim, oftentimes, a notion that is subject to change with their mood and what's trending with the crowd. It's amazing to me how you can find yourself going through situations. It's something along the lines of this. If you're watching television, there, or listening uh, to what's going on on the internet, you'll find yourself saying, oh, this is the current trend. Well, what's interesting is, is that trend, which is supposed to be really hot right now, was really hot last year. In fact, you probably have a lot of things in the very back of your closet that if you wait long enough, they're going to be the it happening thing. But when you had it, it was like, Oh, that's so 2019. That's how we are, isn't it? And so we follow these ebb and flow of trends, and we're always looking beyond what we have for something more to appease us. And what we're going to look at today is this snapshot that we see in Scripture that is, in fact, embracing this very understanding of the fickleness of human nature. These kind of people are among those that are truly insatiable. Even God isn't good enough. They embrace him while looking around to see what else may serve to satisfy their present desires, their needs, and their wants. For them, and sadly, oftentimes for us, God is only as good as what he's done for us yesterday. Today, he must yet do something more to keep us satisfied, or else we'll stray away and give up on you altogether. Now, I know some of you are saying, Oh, not me, Pastor. Not me. Can I get a little more? Yes. Yes, me. We do this when instead of trusting in God's goodness, we look over the shoulder and we're looking for that thing that will distract us, to satisfy us for the moment, to fill in that void we think we have. And that is the essence of sin. Amen? And we all do it. We all do it. It sounds harsh, perhaps, 
That's the way we are. We're a fickle bunch of human beings. We like something new a lot, and we want more of it when it's a novelty and it wears off. We like it less and less, but we still think it's all right until less often, and then we finally find our fill of it. We've grown weary of it. We don't like it at all, and we're ready to be rid of it altogether. I used to love crystal cheeseburgers. Anybody? I love a sack full of crispy cheese bread. And they're great. But you'll leave them down about the sixth one, you're thinking, man, this is so good. By about the tenth one, you're like, eat. You may be just a sack full of crispy cheese burgers all the time. I guarantee you, by about the end of the second sack, you'll be like, I'm going to go and see a sack full of crispy cheese burgers ever again. That's the way we are. We pursue something until we think we've had enough of it, and then we want more, and then we get more of it, and then when it wears off, we don't want to see it anymore. We don't like it at all. We're ready to be done with it. At least until we start having those nostalgic thoughts about it. Man, those Christmas cheese burgers were so good. I've been making so many of them. And so we do this. We repeat this cycle over and over and over again. And we do it with sin. That's the condition of the human heart. We want what we want until we don't want it anymore. And then we don't want what we want until we want it again. And then until we want it again. And then we don't want it anymore. Today's text, that Palm Sunday message, we take a closer look at the way Christ made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, why he did it that way. Also the reason why the people responded the way they did, and finally what caused such a stir in Jerusalem, and what it means to us today. So please, stand with me this morning in honor of the reading of God's word. Tim, you put it up there for us, Matthew 21, beginning of verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to Daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowd that went on ahead of him. And those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's pray. Before we come and we bow our heads and our hearts, Pray, dear Jesus, that you would open our eyes that we might see the truth you have for us today, our ears that we might hear that truth, our minds that they would be open to that truth, and our hearts that we would be receptive, that we would take this truth and live it out in our lives. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. May be seated. The way he chose to enter. The scripture says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethlehem on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey there, tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Now I want you to imagine in your spiritual imaginations with me that you're sharing a bedtime story to a little one about a great champion who rides in to save the day. We imagine 
a hero that rides in to save the day on some sturdy and stately looking steed, a tall, pure red stallion, a person to be dressed in gleaming white robes with glistening polished armor, brandishing a magnificent sword in one hand and a shield with a, a royal coat of arms in the other, followed by his comrades who would carry his banners high behind him, flowing, and a vast army that surrounds them and follows this majestic troop, all to the appropriate and accompanied soundtrack of horses' hooves clattering and trumpets blaring to announce the hero's arrival to save the day. Are you with me? You got it? But that's not what happened. Imagine now that that's what happens in a Hollywood movie, some story which will pack some of your dream, but that isn't the way the Lord chose to enter. Jesus, the great champion of God, the savior of our souls, the Lord of life itself, the conqueror of sin, death, and hell, chose not to do anything like that at all. He easily could have. He could have made a spectacular event of it. It would have been even more than we could have ever imagined. And he will at that next trumpet. Instead, Jesus chose the more humble, the more gentle, the more peaceful, the more authentic of Philip, the more God honoring manner in which to enter. It was Louis A. Barbera Jr. who writes in his commentary, if anyone questioned their actions, they were to say the Lord needed them. As Messiah, he had the right to request whatever he needed. Matthew mentioned that this act fulfilled prophecy, namely that of Zechariah 9, 9, Isaiah 62, 11, which spoke to the nation of the coming of a king in a gentle manner, riding on a colt, a foal, literally the son of a donkey. This is not the normal way in which a king would ride. He usually came as conquerors, riding on horses. Colt was a symbol of peace. It shouldn't surprise us though today. You see, it's only when people feel they have something to prove to others that they feel the need to demonstrate who they are and what they are with how they do it. Yet when a person neither feels they have the need to prove anything to anyone, not who they are, not what they are, they can then focus on how they are to do it and then they just do it. Amen? I love to, to watch this uh, uh, clips from the sporting events. And it seems now that so many of these, these really top name athletes, when they make a touchdown, or when they hit a home run, or when they dunk a basket, they have this incredible demonstration of prowess. Yeah, over the top. But the ones who do it all the time, who know they can do it, they just do it. It's not that big a deal. I make my statement. I can't imagine one time I've ever seen a photograph of Babe Ruth doing some kind of, you know, epic dance on the sidelines after he hit the home run. Can you? No. I can't think of one. He just got out there and did it. Jesus didn't need to manifest this great bravado to try to convince anybody because he already knew who he was and what he was and how he was going to be. Amen? But this was the first time that Jesus publicly proclaimed by his action and his desire to prophetically fulfill scripture who he was. The Lord Jesus knew exactly what he was supposed to do, how he was supposed to do it, when and where. And he had nothing more to prove. He was on a mission to complete it, and now it was time to finish it. That's why he chose to enter the way he did. Secondly, why he chose to enter that way. The text reads, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. 
Say the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Matthew reveals this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. The reason he chose to enter the way he did was because the chose, he chose the way of obedience. He chose this way because it was the way it had been prophesied that he would do it the way God's word, his written word, had said it would happen. And he did it just as he said he would do it. A better way to demonstrate who he was. There didn't need to be the trumpet blare. There didn't need to be the, the banners flying. It just needed to be, that's what he said he would do, and he did it. Amen? It's always interesting to me. The famous story about Babe Ruth as he stepped up to the plate, and he pointed out with his back to the, the grandstands. Before he even swung his back, he was telling everybody what he was going to do. The story, as you remember, is that he did hit the home run. It was an epic event. Now, it wasn't surprising that he hit the home run. What was surprising is that he called it, amen? Jesus was fulfilling prophecy. Mary continues, when they reached the town of Bethphage on the eastern slopes of the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples ahead to find a donkey in his colt. Though all four gospel accounts include the triumphal entry, only Matthew mentioned the donkey along with the colt. MacArthur makes an interesting point. Having just arrived in the town, Jesus would have had no opportunity to make arrangements for the use of these animals. Yet he knows exactly, precisely the location of the animals and the disposition of the owners. Such detailed foreknowledge reveals his divine omniscience. Hold the fold of a donkey, quotes Zechariah 9 9 exactly. The Jewish multitudes recognize the fulfillment of the prophecy and respond with titles and accolades fit only for the Messiah. Now think about this. If you're going to demonstrate who you are, what you're all about, and you're finally going to do it in a way that's over the top, you don't need the trumpets blaring, you don't need the banners blowing, you just tell them, this is what's going to happen, this is how it's going to happen, this is where it's going to happen, and this is where you can find it happen. And everything happens exactly that way. Many times, we find Jesus doing just that. There's the woman at the well. Amen. And she responds to Jesus. This man has told me everything I have done in my life. That was the thing that convinced her. This man is not like anyone else. Carson comments, such an animal was written by rulers in times of peace. Jews certainly understood Zechariah 9 9 to refer to the Messiah often in terms of the Son of David. Therefore, for those with eyes to see, Jesus was not only proclaiming his Messiahship and fulfillment of Scripture, but showing the kind of peace loving approach he was now taking to the city. This wasn't a king coming in to conquer, this was a king coming in to save the day. Big difference. There's only one reason the Lord chose to enter the way he did. And that was to faithfully demonstrate through his obedience to the word of God and demonstrate beyond any doubt that he was the promised one of God, the anointed one, the Messiah. In this, he wanted to reveal to his disciples and all who would have the faith to see that he was clearly in control of all things. By nature and his authority, he grew closer and closer to that date with his destiny at the cross, and he wanted to show them this is not happening beyond me, this is happening because of me. Disciples may not have understood all his teachings, may not have grasped the true nature of his mission. Yet after his resurrection, they would remember his teachings, his miracles, his methods. His message and his manner in moving 
faithfully towards the cross, not away from it, and finding an equal peace in his authority over all these things. It's a lesson for us today, I think. We often find ourselves questioning what is happening around us and why. We struggle when we see the fickleness and wickedness of men seemingly in control when there's so much and we are quick to forget the lessons taught here in this passage. We question the Lord's manner, his message, and his methods when they conflict with our own and we find it isn't until we submit surrender to the authority of God's word, do God's will, and walk in God's way of obedience just as he did find ourselves then able to have peace with this plan and this purpose for our lives, even when we don't understand it, because we've learned to trust it. So we do. We respond to Jesus just as the crowd did that day, first with great shouts of praise and honor, because of the goodness of God who bestows upon us in his common grace. But then when things don't go as we had hoped or planned, to look beyond to that which would satisfy. Third, the reason the crowd responded the way they did, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on, and a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. It had been more than 400 years since the Lord spoke to the Israelites through his prophets. You heard me teach this was the intertestamental period, the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Each of the four Gospels record how John the Baptist had arrived preaching repentance for sin and how like Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 40 verse 3, now he was the voice of one crying out in the wilderness when the Lord Jesus entered into the story and John says of him, prepare the way for the Lord make a straight way for him. So the people were desperate to hear from God. And then in many false messiahs over the years and sparked their hopes. Some were zealots leading and uprising against their harsh taskmasters, these political and military forces that occupied their lands and brought desecration to the temple and their way of life. None, however, lasted long. All were brought down. Now, this Jesus brings a new hope. He speaks as one with authority in the temple. His methods, his miracles, and his manner all demonstrate that he may be the one they've been looking for for so long. The one who spoke of setting men free. If he would liberate them from their enemies, the Romans who occupied their lands, then lead them to peace and stability and prominence in the region, and continue his miracles for the people where the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers were cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor as we read in Matthew 11, 3. Surely he must be the promised one of God, the anointed one, the Messiah. And so this crowd, this crowd who wanted Jesus to be more than they wanted him to be, hailed him as their king praised him with shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna, and threw their palm branches before him as they entered into the city. Arthur notes, spreading one garment on the street was an ancient act of homage reserved for high royalty, suggesting that they recognized his claim to be the king of the Jews. Hosanna transliterates the Hebrew expression that is translated, save now. In Psalm 118.25, blessed is he, quotes verse 26 of the same psalm, exactly. With these expressions, along with the messianic title, Son of David, the crowd is acknowledging Christ's messianic claims. 
the date of this entry was actually Sunday, 9 Nisan, A.D. 30, exactly 483 years after the decree of Artaxerxes mentioned in Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 and 26. 400 years of silence, and now God is speaking. This is the time. Paul Wallace wrote, He came in peace to give the people peace. They preferred salvation from taxation to salvation of their souls. And so in a few days, they would prefer Barabbas to be freed instead of Jesus. Jesus could see that this was their mindset. And so in the midst of this praise, the people waving the palm branches like a national flag, Jesus left. Not what the crowd, people that they were wanting of him, what he was really all about, there were two different things. They had come to place their faith, hope, and trust in Christ as Savior and Lord, and as the most of the disciples did, rather than just a few days, these fickle people like Judas had already determined they would come to realize that they would not be satisfied with his plan and purpose. God's plan and purpose is far different than theirs. And so often is the case, they find themselves now moving away with nothing but lip service. They were proud. They waved palm branches that day. They were proud that called out to him, Hosanna, Hosanna. They were proud that said, We want you to be our king. In just a matter of a few days, they cry out for his death. Oh, why? Christ's triumphal entry caused such a stir. Text continues. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth, Galilee. Why was the whole city stirred? Why did they ask, Who is this? And was it really? He who had caused the stir asked the crowd if they would answer, This is Jesus the prophet. There was a very large crowd that went with Jesus along the way. Some of them had spread their cloaks on the path to acknowledge Jesus' kingship. Others cut palm branches and laid them in the path. That would have caused someone to stir, but that wasn't really what caused the stir. The Gospels tell us that throngs of people came with him in the procession. The news had spread of his arrival in Bethany, and so there was time for the crowds to gather, especially his followers from Galilee, and certainly all those who were looking for the Messiah. Messianic expectations were high, as I shared with you, and when the word spread of Jesus' arrival in the area, people naturally thronged to see him. After all, his miracles, his teachings, and throng crowds everywhere he went. But that wasn't what really caused the stir. And Alan Ross, Alan Ross got it right. He comments the word Hosanna, the Greek writing of the Hebrew verb from the, the psalm save. The Hebrew Hoshishana, pronounced O G A N A, is an imperative for help. In time, it became a proclamation like the Hebrew word, Alleluia, which is an imperative praise the Lord. But it became an acclamation. The cry is addressed to Jesus as Son of David. There was no doubt in the minds of the faithful that this Jesus was the Messiah, heir to the throne of David. This is confirmed by the exclamation Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It is the Psalm 118 I shared with you. It is echoed again verbatim. 
The sentence was a priestly blessing for the king who led the people in procession to the sanctuary to offer the praise to the Lord. But it became a praise to God for the coming of the Messiah. Now, now we're beginning to see the image clear as to what caused the stir. You see, it was the very religious people of the day. It was the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees. It was the Roman leadership of the day. It was those people who began to become stirred. Jesus is coming into the, the, the city. He's being criticized by the leaders for receiving such praise. But Jesus answered that if they did not praise, the stones themselves would cry out. He was and is that great king. I'm sorry, I thought I heard an amen out there. Looking at this part of the text, it suddenly becomes crystal clear. But Paul's disturbed was the very religious people of the day, the very ones who should have had the willingness to step up and step out and give him praise and honor, refused to do so. Instead, it was the everyday, the common people. It was the stones that Jesus said, if they do not, the stones themselves will cry out. Once again, we're seeing truth between being a genuine follower of God and just having an outward appearance. He alone is worthy of praise. Everything in creation will praise him. The whole city was in a stir when, when he comes in. Jesus entered triumphantly. When they asked who this is, they probably wanted to know this Jesus really was it so they could get in a stir over him. It wasn't because he was the king in their mind, it was the king that wasn't in their mind. Who is this man? Who does he think he is? We see him. We see him now clearly as the one who upset the status quo. The very people who should have recognized him refused to do so. And the very people who needed to see him, wanted to see him, did see him. The account here, Matthew leads the reader to a proper conclusion that Jesus was more than a prophet. He is the Messiah, the Son of God, who came to save the world. The text reads, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth in Galilee. And so now we see what caused this stir. It was the fact that Jesus from Nazareth, a nobody from nowhere, was being proclaimed to somebody from somewhere that had done something so amazing that it caused the whole city to be in a stir. Just as prophecy declared Christ's birth to be born of a virgin, he had born in a stable, had been announced to lowly shepherds, and whose star had been followed by wise men for months caused a stir with Herod and the religious leaders of that day. So too now the prophecy of Christ's triumphal entry into the city on that day caused a stir with the very same kind of crowd for the very same kind of reason. Christ's triumphal entry into the city he likes my message, he's doing amen. Uh, 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 no big word. That's what I'm talking about. Christ's triumphal entry into the city and the people's proclamation to him as prophet and priest and king and messiah was a direct threat to the status quo. A direct threat, excuse me, to the way things were, a threat to their power, their privilege, their position. And they weren't ready to submit or surrender to his authority, to his rule and reign. Not to a nobody from nowhere with no background and no connection. And so they shared with the Roman authorities that he had claimed to be king. Now was being considered king of the Jews. 
us usurping their authority as well is caused by the spirit. But what does Christ's triumphal entry mean for the people of that day and for our day have to do with each other? Christ's travel entry means for us today the purpose in riding into Jerusalem was to make a public his claim to be the Messiah, the King of Israel, in fulfillment of Old Testament prophet, prophecy. Matthew says that the king coming on the fall of a donkey is the exact fulfillment of Zechariah 9 9. That's right, brother. Jesus. Rides into his capital city as a conquering king and is hailed by the people as such. The manner of the day. The streets of Jerusalem, the royal city, are opened up to him like a king, and he ascends to his palace, not a temporal palace, but a spiritual palace that is the temple, because his is a spiritual kingdom. He receives the worship and the praise of the people because only he deserves it. No longer does he tell his disciples to be quiet about him, but he tells them to go ahead and shout his praises and worship him openly. The spreading of the cloaks is an act of homage for royalty because he is and was and will always be the royal one. Jesus now openly declaring to everyone, him who has eyes see, those who have ears hear, I am the I am. I am the one who will save you. Daniel Pavan wrote in his work, Ponder the Palm Sunday Paradox. If Jesus knew that a donkey was waiting for him in the next town, he certainly knows what's down the road for you. You may not know that medical test is going to turn out, but Jesus does. Nor may you know whether or not there will be any decent jobs for you when you get done with your education. But Jesus already has in mind how he plans to provide for you. Understanding that Jesus knows all things gives us a confidence to follow his directions. Though Satan would have us believe otherwise, living by Jesus' words will never send you on a fool's errand. Listen to me. If you don't get anything else from this today, I want you to get this. The fact that Jesus was following uh, the, the Lord's words in Scripture prophetically, and he spoke to, demonstrating his omniscience, exactly what was going to be happening, where the donkeys could be found, how the owner's going to be responding, and what to do with them, and how to handle all of that. Jesus is wanting you to know right now, whatever you're dealing with, however you're dealing with it right now, He's already got this under control. Amen? It doesn't matter if it seems too detailed, too complicated, too far-fetched. Let me tell you, if you're out there and you're living with something that's too big for you, it is not too big for him. Amen? He may be putting you in that exact situation so that you can see beyond the sheer doubt, a clarity of a doubt, that he is who he said he is to you. Maybe you're in this situation because your faith needs to be tested so that your faith can become trusted. Amen? You're wondering, oh, but I don't know. I've walked with it for so long. It's been this way and that way, and I've done all of these things. But God is wanting to say, I want to take you further. I want to grow you up. I want you to be able to trust in me beyond a shadow of a doubt. I want you to be able to know that the great I am is always with you. So here's what's going to happen. You may not know twisting the turn, but I'm going to tell you right now, I got this. I got this. I shared with someone. It's been several months ago now. They lost the loved one. And I said to that precious one, I said, I know you couldn't see this one. But it didn't catch the Lord by surprise. I know that it's painful for you right now. You can't see his plan and his purpose in any of this. But God's got a plan and a purpose in all of it. Because I can tell you with absolute confidence, absolute confidence, 
and God has a plan and purpose for you. And when God has a plan and purpose for you, there is nothing that's going to happen in your life that's not first filtered through His mercy, grace, and love and His plan and purpose for you. That means nothing. That's just one of the things. Do you really believe what Romans 8 28 is teaching us? It says, All things work together for the good. Not some, not most. All things, amen. Even those things we don't understand. Even those things that are painful. Even those things that, that just seem like they're impossible. Oh my goodness. Because we could just really put our arms around that and our best best knees. And marry that on with what Jesus demonstrated on that triumphal entry that day. We would never be afraid of another thing. Amen. God's got this. We may not understand it. We come to Him and say, How's this going to work out? Are we going to hear from Him as His people? I got to tell you. We make those steps. He tells us to come into the city. He tells us to go in the word. He tells us to go to the doctor's office. He tells us to go to school. He tells us to get up every day and put one foot forward in front of the other. Keep trusting him. Keep walking with him. Keep believing in him. Keep doing what he's telling us to do. And we're going to find things work out just like he told us they would. Amen? And when we walk away with that, there is absolutely nothing that can happen in life that's going to overwhelm us. Because what's really overwhelming us is he is God. With us, for us, not against us. And then we won't be crippled because we will be able to shoulder that what else might come along where we will find ourselves satisfied. The question before us, having heard this, is will we respond as Christ's disciples did? As faithful followers that day in obedience to Christ's commands, even when it doesn't make sense. Will we acknowledge Christ as Savior and Lord and submit and surrender to his plan and his purpose? Or will we be like that critical crowd? We will remain only as long as Christ meets our felt needs. No longer if he commands us to do something we don't understand. Something we are not interested in submitting or surrendering to. No longer interested in pursuing if it costs us more of our heart, more of our mind, more of our soul, more of our strength, more of our time, more of our talent or our treasure. You see, we have a choice before us. The crowd was eager to rush. Christ into their city that day with shouts of acclaim, eager to see more of what Christ could do for them, among them, but not to them. We're no different from the people in the crowd that day when we were ready and willing to accept God's gifts, but not the giver. We only want what He can give us, but not anything to do with Him. And He commands, you are not. Mary wanting to submit or surrender to him. Not really wanting to be his word, his will, and his way. It makes us that very quick bunch. Now we come full circle to the issue of being a fickle lot as human beings. Yes, we're content in one moment, covetous in the next, incapable of being satisfied or appeased. But we're never truly grateful. Thankful for what we receive until we step back and realize if Jesus is all we ever had, we'll always have everything we ever need. Amen. Do anything less than that. Well, what it mean to be a disciple? What it mean to be a true believer? Would it serve to bring praise and honor to him? That leads me to ask just one more question. Will we respond when Jesus comes riding humbly into our lives? Oh, I don't mean at that moment of salvation. I mean when he calls out to us 
to recognize him as Savior and Lord. But he calls out to us with a command to go and do as he commanded us to do. Will we do his command? How will we respond? Will we obey? It's only then that we'll find the peace we need. In closing, I'll share this quick story with you. It's a quote, and I can't remember the exact quote. But she said that if there were ever a problem in the promised praise and honor and glory that you would bring to God, how much credit would bring to your life? And she said, no, no, I never did. I never did consider all of that. Not any more than the donkey that Christ rode into Jerusalem on. Never once did that little donkey consider, look at me. All these people shouting and proclaiming and, and giving me all the, the accolades. Never once did the little donkey consider that because the donkey knew his place. I'm just a donkey. I'm just a servant. I'm just a vehicle that God is using to reach the world around me. Amen. Friends, does your life demonstrate this? Are you able to be used to God in such a humble and gentle way? Or are you, are you fighting him? Are you running for credit? Stop fighting. Submit to surrender to him. Amen. You'll find peace. You'll find an incredible blessing in that peace as well. He's not only got you, he's got the whole situation he always has. Amen. Thank you. Well, we learned a lot of lessons from this. An incredible opportunity to see this snapshot again. But it's more than just that. It's a lesson for us as well. A lesson, Lord, that I, I try to communicate to you. I keep it telling you, my stammer is, Lord, made it probably, probably not clear to the reader, but I hope they heard the message today. But you always have had this, you always will. Everything is in your hand. Take it in great peace to them, Lord, no matter where they are. Pray that you would bless them, that you would keep them, that you would make yourself gracious and smile upon their hearts. She be gracious unto them and give them your peace. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Church, when we leave this place, where are you going? I'll see you out there. Tim, play us out.
will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great 